Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tommy Shelby, and I'm the chair of the Department of African and African American Studies and a professor of philosophy here in Harvard. Um, but, if, but before I introduce the next panel, I just wanted to say that was an incredibly powerful and informative panel. So thanks so much for that, and thanks for the wonderful performance from Joy Bilmwani, um, which was a, a great, way, great way to start off a, a, a quite deep and, uh, and in some ways scary, but as we say, hopeful uh, conversation. Um, so my, my pleasure, as I say, and an honor to introduce the, the participants of the next panel. And the thematic focus of the panel is mass incarceration and cultural narratives. So over-incarceration, over-criminalization, horrid and inhumane prison conditions, harsh and merciless sentences, the torture and trauma of solitary confinement, and the civic death that's imposed even after release from prison. These practices are destroying the lives of many individuals and many communities. Mass incarceration is, of course, marked by systemic racial injustice, from policing and prosecution to prison administration and reentry. The problem has rightly and um, urgently become the object of organized resistance, both inside and outside prison walls. Prisons are too often out of public view, where we can easily ignore their presence and forget about those who are confined. So in this domain especially, we need artists and storytellers, many of whom are or were incarcerated themselves, to bring the prison system out of the shadows and to shine a light on the many injustices, the burden, the forgotten, and the unseen. Such work is also essential, of course, for holding law enforcement and legislators accountable for how they administer crime control practices and how they treat those in their custodial care. And so to help us think through these complex issues and of the role of art and cultural counter narratives in addressing them, we have a truly distinguished group of individuals. Moderating the panel will be Daniel Allen. Allen is the James Bryant Conant University Professor here at Harvard University and also the director of Harvard's Edmund J. Saffer Center for Ethics. She's a wide-ranging um, political theorist who has published uh, in democratic theory and political sociology and in the history of political thought, both ancient and modern. She's the author of many influential books, including Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality, published in uh, 2014, Education and Equality, and most recently, and perhaps most pertinent for uh, this panel's theme, is the amazing book, Cuz, The Life and Times of Michael A. Alan is a MacArthur Fellow and an elected member of the American Philosophical Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Elizabeth Hinton is the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of the Social Sciences in the Departments of History and African and African American Studies here at Harvard. Hinton's research focuses on the persistence of poverty and of racial inequality in 20th century uh, United States. She is the author of the award-winning and really field-defining book, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration uh, in America. She's quite a passionate defender of the rights of prisoners and of the formerly incarcerated to get an education, get access to education. Hinton's numerous op-eds can be found in such venues as the Boston Review, the Los Angeles Times, The Nation, The New York Times, and Time Magazine. She is a Ford Foundation Fellow and an Andrew Carnegie Fellow as well. And Brian Stevenson, who of course will be addressing us tonight in his keynote lecture and will get a, a proper introduction from the incomparable Elizabeth Alexander. But here I'll, I'll be brief. Stevenson is the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, EJI, in Montgomery, Alabama. And under his leadership, EJI has won major legal challenges, eliminating unfair sentences, ex exonerating the innocent from uh, innocent death row prisoners, confronting abuse of the incarcerated and the mentally ill, and aiding children prosecuted as adults. 
In fact, you recently won a historic ruling, as many of you know, uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court banning mandatory life without parole sentences for children 17 or younger. <clears throat> He's a graduate, graduate of Harvard Law School and has been awarded uh, some 34 honorary degrees, maybe more since I've written that. <laughs> and he is the author of the war-winning and deeply moving uh, New York Times bestseller, Just Mercy. In April 2018, EGI opened the new museum, the Legacy Museum from Enslavement to Mass Incarceration, built on the site of a former slave warehouse in downtown Montgomery. This is a companion to the National Memorial to Victims of Lynching, the extraordinary National Memorial for Peace and Justice. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Danielle Allen, Elizabeth Hinton, and Brian Stevenson. It is such an honor to be with everybody here today. My sister friend Elizabeth, Brian, there's a small list of people of whom I say, I just feel grateful to have been alive when this man walked the earth. <laughs> but it's also the case that, as Hank Willis Thomas said earlier, that one of the beautiful things about this conversation today is the discovery that we've all been working together some of us knew that about some of the rest of us, but now we all know it about each other, and that is an incredibly powerful thing. So we're gonna do more of that working together in this conversation. We're switching from that remarkable, unsettling tale of control to another story of control. Narrative is at the core of all of this, and few people are more eloquent on that subject than the two people I'm sitting here with. I'm going to start with one small digression into deep history, though, for our country anyway, because it came up earlier this morning and because I think we're going to get to history in this conversation. The Declaration of Independence came up, and Sarah started with that terrific re-rendering of the famous image of the signing. So I wanted to add one additional image to your archive of re-renderings, because there's a little story that goes with it about just how deep the narrative problems go and in what small might new, new ways they show up. So I wrote this book that Professor Shelby alluded to, our declaration about the Declaration of Independence, and it, sa it says our for a reason, because I'm putting myself there in the story, and the book was born in a night class that I taught on the south side of Chicago for low-income adults, where we read the Declaration of Independence together and of all the texts we read, it was the most powerful for all of us because we sat there listening to the grievances about the king and thinking about the city of Chicago. And it's not hard to have a list of grievances about the city of Chicago and to have a recognition of the relationship between language of rights and freedom, diagnosing your circumstances and looking forward to a course of action to achieve change. My students were all there because they were seeking change in their lives and they got that text and I wrote that book for them. And that is everywhere through every single page of that book. But when I got my cover design, all right, it was that engraving of all the 56 white signers of the Declaration. I was like, people, I said, our Declaration, not their Declaration. So we've had all these incredible artists on the stage today and designers and these beautiful visionaries, I am not such a person. So the best I could do was say, you gotta add a photo of my students on top of that other photo. First I just said, add a photo of my students, and it came back below the signers. So I said, no, 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 no. That's not, this is our declaration. And my students there in that picture, reading, writing, talking, deliberating, deciding about the future of their community and their city, we're doing exactly the same thing as the people in the picture below. But I had to make this case. 2014, the sort of designer read my book, and still I had to push the old pictures out of their mind, like literally push the old pictures out of their mind. That's what we're talking about here today. And 
So let me, I want to start with very simple questions for both my colleagues, and then we'll get into the deeper, harder work of why it is we need narrative work to end the problem of mass incarceration. So my simple story is we all, oh, sorry, come back to that one in a second. We all know Brian's remarkable monument. And you, you can say so many important things about it, but right now I only want you to tell us, and here's one more picture up here for you to think about, what visually this means to you, what do you feel when you look at your monument? Well, you know, in a lot of ways, um, I went to Berlin, and I went to the Brandenburg Square where they have the Holocaust Memorial, and what struck me about it is that there are no words. They actually trust people to enter that place with a narrative about the Holocaust that will allow them to have an emotional and meaningful experience with these very abstract figures. When we built our memorial, we knew we couldn't do that because in this country, we don't actually have a narrative that talks about this era of racial terrorism and lynching. Mm -hmm. We knew we had to contextualize it. We had to create a path. And so um, the first thing you see is a sculpture of enslaved people in chains, um, standing with dignity, but standing in suffering. And the most remarkable thing for me is how many people have said, you know, I've been in this country my whole life. I've never seen a sculpture on slavery that tries to mm -hmm. depict the brutality of enslavement and the humanity of those enslaved. And then we narrate this journey, and then we get into the memorial. And what we want people to see uh, are these brown structures, first at eye level, very human. You can read the names. Uh, and then when you get to the second quarter, the floor drops, and they begin to rise. And then you get to the third quarter, and they're above you. And that's the thing about lynching and racial terror. The people who perpetrated that violence could have buried the bodies right. and probably killed even more people that we right. would never know about. But they actually wanted to do the opposite. They wanted to lift them up. They wanted to torment and taunt and terrorize communities of color. But that's why we don't talk about thousands of victims of lynchings. We talk about millions of victims of lynchings because every person of color was terrorized and menaced by that violence. And so we want to replicate those dynamics because we don't think people should have a safe place to stand mm -hmm. when they're confronting something like racial terrorism, lynching in this country mm -hmm. that went unaddressed for 100 years. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing we show people is the park where we have the replicas of the monuments and we have a sculpture of three women. The monument, the memorial is actually in the neighborhood where black women organized in the 1950s to make the Montgomery bus boycott this catalyst that pushed this nation into civil rights. And we have that statute. And then we have Hank Willis Thomas's powerful a statute at the end, but a uh, statue at the end. But uh, in the park, we have a replica of each of them because we're calling every one of these counties to action. We mm -hmm. want every county in America where lynching took place to claim the replica of these mm -hmm. monuments, take it back to their county, and begin this process of truth and reconciliation locally. I'm going to come back to that point about action in a minute, but I first want to talk to Elizabeth about her book cover and ask you to share the story of this and how it connects to your own understanding of your role as a historian, again, trying to push those old stories, old pictures out of people's minds. I became a historian in order to change narratives. I grew up in the 1980s and really came of age in the 1990s at the height of um, the crack impact of crack in, in low-income and particularly African-American communities and the rhetoric about um, gun violence that was going on in the 80s and 90s. And I saw directly the ways in which drug addiction and violence played out in, among members of my own family and knew that the narratives going on at this time, the idea that somehow, you know, the super predator narratives, the idea that, um, that black people were innately criminal and violent weren't true. And so I've always been um, passionate about these issues and seeking to change these issues through historical understanding and research, uh, which is partly how I came to, to the research at the center of this book. The, the cover depicts um, an, a moment from the Newark uprising in 1967. So this was one of the largest incidents of collective urban violence and unrest that the United States witnessed in the 1960s, coming a week before um, the uprising in Detroit, Michigan, which required the deployment of federal troops. And uh, in Newark, 
contrary to many of the narratives that are told about these incidents of collective violence and community violence, um, most of the people, of the hundreds of people who lost their lives during these incidents in the 1960s, 60s, the vast majority were, of course, black residents at the hands of police. Um, during the Newark uprising, there was a lot of, um, of police sniping, a lot of shooting going on um, in the air. And this, this uh, the cover actually depicts um, what we would see, regard today as a, as a drive-by shooting. This is, a dri this is an early drive-by shooting um, by police officers. Drive-bys are characterized by uh, the use of relatively massive manpower in a vehicle moving and just kind of shooting at um, uh, a stationary target or a, a crowd of people. Um, and this gets us to kind of rethink our narratives about um, violence, who, who, who is a victim, who has a monopoly on violence, when is violence justified? Um, you know, when, when we look at this cover, we don't necessarily see it as a drive-by shooting, but in fact, um, that's what it is in 1967. In the 1980s and 90s, when drive-by shootings became far too common in low-income uh, neighborhoods of color, these things are discussed as, 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 as if they're kind of the natural outgrowth of, what, of, of pathology in these communities instead of a historically distinct manifestation of a convergence of decisions, policy decisions, disinvestments, um, and, and historical inequalities playing out in this, in this moment in the late 20th century. So the, the power on this stage is phenomenal, the power invested in changing narratives. And the other thing that's beautiful about the chance to have this conversation is to name the nature of the work, which is this effort to connect changing narratives to concrete changes in policy and people's actions in embodied experiences. Brian has said one of the most profound things I know of on this subject of where narrative and action come together. He says of his work with death row clients, I became aware that the rights framework, the insistence on the rule of law, was still, going, was still going to be constrained by the meta-narratives that push judges to stop at a certain point, the environment outside the courts. That's what pushed me to think more critically about narrative, not just within a brief, within a case, within an action, but more broadly. Right? Rights only go so far, they are limited by narrative. Okay, it's that coming together is the key thing. So to really, oops, sorry, drive home the point about what we're trying to push over. I wanted to share an image of a correctional center from downtown Chicago. So this one is not out of sight, to the contrary. This one is solidified with beauty. You may not think it's beautiful, but it's intended to be beautiful as a piece of architecture. I'm guessing, the, the, now the oh, David Adagio is probably come up here and tell me how wrong I am to say that. But it's designed by a very famous architect, Harry Weiss. It's an example of Chicago modernism and one of its later iterations, as I understand. Again, Sarah will educate me afterwards, I'm sure. And it is this incredibly minimalist form, a triangle with these tiny slit windows. It's a sculptural object, helping everybody feel proud about incarceration. And as David did say in Fiaster, when we build the environment, it fixes those narratives. So the narrative work that you're trying to do to end mass incarceration is about making this building so ugly, we want to tear it down. OK, how are we going to do that? <laughs> Brian, what's next? Well, what, we have, what do we need to we, do? We have to reveal the pain and the suffering and the inhumanity that's going on within the building. Uh, and if we don't see the people inside, if we don't know that uh, people are being locked down, if we don't know that there might be 10 and 11 year old children in there because Illinois doesn't have a minimum age or trying a child as an adult who are being tormented, if we don't know about the suffering, then we're not going to actually see what's wrong with the building. And for me, that's the great challenge that we face is to tear down the facade so that you can actually see the inequality and injustice that's happening inside. And, the, and that was the point that I was trying to make earlier with, with that quote you read. The law won't help us. Uh, it won't help us. 
We're going to need art and narrative and exploration and powerful books like Professor's, Professor Hinton's to kind of pull away some of these things. You know, what, when this became clear to me, I'm just quick quick little mini thing, death penalty. 1972, the Supreme Court strikes down the death penalty because they conclude it's being applied arbitrarily. To the Legal Defense Fund, the death penalty was a civil rights issue. Uh, they knew that 87% of the people executed for, this, for, the, for the crime of rape in this country were black men accused of raping white women. 100% mm -hmm. of the people executed for that offense uh, were executed offenses involving victims who were white, even though women of color were three times more likely to be the victims of sexual assault. Court says it's arbitrary, unpredictable. Most people thought that was the end of the death penalty. The South revolts, says, no, we need uh, the death penalty. And because the court didn't say it was cruel and unusual punishment, uh, they come back with these new statutes. The court in 1976 upholds it, saying we can't conclude that these new statutes, uh, statutes won't work any better than the old ones. Then comes McCleskey. And this is why when I talk to audiences, I feel like you can't understand what we're dealing with in the justice sector until you understand this case, mm -hmm. where lawyers went to prove that the modern death penalty operated in a racially discriminatory manner. They looked at every homicide in Georgia over an eight-year time period. They came up with powerful data 11 times more likely to get the death penalty if the victim is white than if the victim is black, 22 times more likely to get the death penalty if the defendant is black and the victim is white. They took the data to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court accepted their evidence and nonetheless concluded that Georgia's death penalty was constitutional. And it's the rationale that, that, that really ought to break your heart. The first thing they said was, um, if we deal with racial disparities in the death penalty, it's going to be just a matter of time before we start seeing these disparities and arguments about these disparities for drug crimes and property crimes and misdemeanor crimes. Mm -hmm. And Justice Brennan wrote in his dissent that it was a, quote, fear of too much justice mm -hmm. that allowed the court to rule the way they ruled. Mm -hmm. But it was the second thing that I have to tell you was the thing that radicalized my relationship as a young lawyer. The court said a certain quantum of discrimination, mm -hmm. a certain amount of bias, a certain level of racial discrimination is, in our opinion, inevitable. Mm -hmm. That's the word they use to mm -hmm. characterize this result. And having argued cases before the Supreme Court, I stand there and I have to read equal justice under law. There is no way you can reconcile a doctrine of inevitability mm -hmm. with this commitment to equal mm -hmm. justice under mm -hmm. law. And as I began to kind of see that manifest itself, what scared me, what shocked me, was this realization I had about 10 years ago. I'm a product of Brown. I grew up in a community where black kids had to go to the public, uh, to colored schools. We didn't have high schools for black kids in my community. Lawyers came into our community, made them open up to public schools. That's what attracted me about law, is they had the power mm -hmm. to get people to do things that the democratic process wouldn't. But about 10 years ago, I realized that we couldn't win Brown versus Board of Education today. Mm -hmm. I don't think we could. We would not win Brown today. We don't have a court that's committed to equal justice sufficiently to help a disfavored and disenfranchised group have their rights respected against the political will of all of these masses, I, this court would not do it. And the reason why they won't do it is because we've lost that narrative struggle. And so for me, it's unmasking what's inside the building. It's actually exposing, telling the stories of inequality and injustice in a way where we cannot reconcile our commitment to equality mm -hmm. and justice with these disparities, with this heartbreak, with this pain. I tell people that reading McCleskey mm. was probably the hardest thing, one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I say that, you know, with some history, when you represent people on death row, you have difficult, difficult challenges. And I represented a man some years ago who didn't have a lawyer. We tried to stop his execution. We weren't able to. And it was the first time I went down to be with somebody who was about to be executed. And I never will forget the conversation we had. This is when they still electrocuted people. And I was back there, and when I got there, uh, they shaved the hair off of his body to make him um, more efficient uh, when the electricity would pass through him. And he was really unnerved by that. But then he started telling me about his day. And what he said is that, Brian, all day long people have been saying, what can I do to help you? Mm. They came to me this morning and said, what do you want for breakfast? What do you Gosh. want for lunch? What do you want for dinner? He said, every 15 minutes somebody was saying, what can I do to help you? Can I get you the phone? Can I get you the stamps? Can I get you the letter? And I never will forget him saying, he said, Brian, it's been such a strange day. He said, more people have asked me, what can I do to help you in the last 14 hours of my life than they ever did in the first 19 years of my life. Right. And holding that man's hand, I couldn't help but think, yeah, where were they when you were three and you were being physically abused? Where were they when you were seven and your mom died? Where were they when you were 11 and you were experimenting with drugs? Where were they when you came back from Vietnam traumatized? And with those questions resonating in my mind, they pulled that man away 
strapped him to an electric chair, and executed him. But as hard as that was, it wasn't as hard as reading a decision from the United States mm. Supreme Court talking about the inevitability of racial bias mm -hmm. in the administration of the death penalty. And our society allowed it to happen. Yeah. And that's yeah. why the artists and the narratives and the historians have had to get busy. And that's what excites me about being on the stage with the two of you, because oh, that's what you're trying to expose. Yeah. Thank you. I have to ask Diana a follow up. So, I'm so glad that you brought our attention to the McCluskey case, because as I read it and I teach it in my mass incarceration historical perspective course, um, and I discuss it in my book, I mean, this was the moment when it became impossible to prove racism in the criminal justice system. And it also coincides with the year, of course, when the 100 to 1 crack sentencing in 1986, when the, the disparity is introduced um, an Anti-Drug Abuse Act in, in, in Congress and passed by the federal government. So what I'm hearing you say is that that decision made you more cynical about the ability of the law to change narratives. Is this, did, did, did it cause you to kind of shift gears in, in your strategy? I, I'd say it made me understand the limits of the law in ways that I hadn't been, I was a very young lawyer, and I was so struck with the power of the lawyers under Brown to do these things. Mm -hmm. And it's still true that we need the law. Right. Like ending life without parole for children is not something we could do at the political mm -hmm. process. Marriage equality isn't something we could do at the political process, so we still need it. But I realized that we're gonna need our artists and our historians mm -hmm. and our storytellers and our researchers to begin working on this narrative right. struggle to change the consciousness mm -hmm. of those decision makers, of those mm -hmm. justices, so that they would be too ashamed to talk about the inevitability of discrimination. And unfortunately, there's an absence of shame at the United yeah. States Supreme Court. So, I wanna pick up on. I want to pick up on that theme of shame, where it exists and where it doesn't exist. It's like it exists in all the wrong places, right? It doesn't exist where it should exist and exists in all the wrong places. So I'm thinking about this building again, and you drew us straight to the specifics of Illinois. An 11 year old could be in there facing the worst of penalties. And I don't have a single story I could pin on this building. I'm thinking of Hank's billboards again. I can't tell anybody's story that might be attached to this building. When I wrote Cuz, which is a story of my baby cousin, who we lost to the criminal justice system, a 12-year sentence on his first arrest for an attempted carjacking, and released from prison after 11 years, killed three years later by somebody he'd met in prison. So at any rate, um, when I wrote that book, I went around the country talking about it. It was hard to talk about. And I had a friend who said to me, well, Daniel, just remember you're a story catcher. Because you're, you're there, yes, you're telling your story, but what you're gonna discover is that when you go there, everybody else is gonna give you their story. And that's exactly what I found. And I just, I thought of myself as like a butterfly net. <laughs> go around the world as a butterfly net, letting stories come to me. But the incredible thing about that, the real powerful lesson of it was how many stories there are mm -hmm. and how few we hear. And this is a completely obvious point if you think about it for two seconds because 2.25 million people are incarcerated and they all have people they're connected to. So and that's every year for the last decade plus, et cetera. So you just add up the numbers and you realize that there are millions and millions of stories that I now think of as butterflies floating out there in the world that we don't hear. So I wanted to ask this question of, we need to hear the stories. Why don't we hear the stories? Is it shame? Are there other forces working? Elizabeth, you work really, really hard to get the stories of incarcerated people onto public stages like this. You did that a year ago. You had incredible voices here on this stage. Can you tell us what you think about why we don't hear all the stories we should hear and what we can do about it? Well, I think in general, and this, this has to do with the core of the issues that we've been talking about for the past few days. You know, who gets to be seen as a human being? Who counts? Who's a citizen? Whose lives matter? And throughout our history, that has not been poor people, and that has not been people of color. 
and the stigma that is attached to criminality and certainly incarceration, the invisibility. I mean, I think you know, the, the point that you made here is really important. This is in the middle of Chicago, uh, but most of our prisons are in far, places far, far away from here, removed from society, barred from the people inside, barred from everyday human interaction. Um, that's so crucial, and I think that the divisions in our society in general, and a lot of that has to do with narrative, a lot of that has to do with representation, but prevent us, create a, an atmosphere of fear where we're unable to see <laughs> our fellow human beings as human beings. Of course, this is wrapped up in our, in our long history. Of course, this is wrapped up in this idea of inevitability, of, um, of criminality among people of color as being inevitable. That's something that I, that I found and uncovered in my research and justified a lot the escalation of police and incarceration um, at, at all levels of government. But I think a lot of it just, you know, it has to do so much with whose, whose voices get to be included and, and, um, and the, the divisions among us. I remain inspired by the abolitionist movement and the ways in which it really took... Um, getting the voices of enslaved Africans out there to generate awareness about the issue. And I think that's something that, you know, since I've been doing this work has really changed. Mm -hmm. um, and many of the formerly incarcerated people who are really at the forefront of uh, criminal justice reform movements, you know, they would say those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And so much of it is about, as we rethink, um, you know, approaches to, um, problems of inequality and punishment is, is how to amplify those voices and to help get those voices front and center in our discussions. And so as you do work on getting the voices of incarcerated people out and collaborating with efforts that they're leading and building, um, can you tell us about one of the things that makes you most hopeful? Where do you see the most positive work happening right now? I think that this, that it's been amazing to me, even since I've been at Harvard, uh, the ways in which thinking on this issue has changed, the ways in which these voices are becoming kind of part of our discussions about these issues. You know, since I've been here in the past two years, um, I've been, I've had the, the privilege and the honor to sit here at Sanders Theater, but in other venues around campus with formerly incarcerated people. I think that, you know, as the as people are aware, become aware of the issue, become aware of the kind of arbitrary lo laws, um, and Tommy mentioned this in his introduction, and, and the kind of um, extremely harsh sentencing that has been attached to misdemeanor crimes, um, prob the problems of drug abuse, that we've, our, our thinking on this has really begun to change. Of course, um, you know, the kind of important forces of popular narrative shifting um, has contributed to this kind of change in, in collective consciousness greatly from Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow Book to Ava DuVernay's documentary The 13th. I think that the more that we can begin to, you know, present these issues in a completely different way to a popular audience, as, as, as Brian just said, we will begin to plant the seeds that will help shift worldviews on these issues to realize that things like um, drive-by shootings in certain communities aren't natural, that gun violence is unacceptable, that um, the, the kind of systematic removal of entire groups of people from communities into faraway cages um, shouldn't happen in the land of the free. So this is a good point of connection, right? I mean, one of the things we're getting is that there's all this taken for granted stuff. Yeah. And that's, so th this, here's another form of invisibility being brought into visibility, right? The taken for granted being brought into visibility so we can stop taking it for granted and put a new picture in that place. Yeah, and, yeah. and I just think, just in, to echo what, what Elizabeth is saying, because I think it's really important how there is this relationship between power and vulnerability and who can shape narrative and who can't. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, is that you know, our history, when you're enslaved, you have to focus on freedom. A and what happened to African Americans, we had to be entirely focused on being free. And then when we got free, we weren't safe. So then we had to focus on security. Uh, and then we got secure, more secure, we didn't have any rights, and so we had to focus on rights. 
And what we keep forgetting in this country is that we're in the early days of a post-enslavement, post-terror, mm -hmm. post-apartheid history. Right. We're just getting out of this horrific <laughs> era. And, mm -hmm. and, and for a long time, I think our foreparents thought that narrative struggle was a luxury. Right. And, and because mm -hmm. of that, we didn't engage in it. And so the North won the Civil War, but the South won the Narrative mm -hmm. War. They were never yeah. required to <laughs> repudiate racial mm -hmm. uh, inequality and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and then we, we got the federal government to intervene to stop mob lynching, but the lynchers won the narrative war. They See, didn't I'm have gonna, to ever apologize. I, am gonna, I agree with you completely that the South won the narrative war, but the one place I'm gonna push back is on the account you gave of our forefathers. No, I'm not, it's not, it's not yeah. as if, I, I mean, listen, I wasn't doing narrative work for the first 20 years of my career. So I'm not suggesting, and, and our four parents did. Look, as Frederick Douglass was out there, he was doing all about narrative. I'm just saying that the collectively. And our friend Du Bois, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to, because I want to say his phrase. That was my, my real reason for pushing back on you is because I wanted to say that Du Bois pushed us all to be co-creators in the kingdom of culture. Th th there have always. I just wanted to say that out loud, yeah, okay? No, there have always Take that been. that away. Co-creators in the yeah. kingdom of culture. There have That's always been about. those people. I guess what I'm trying to say is that now we're living at a time where we can take over Sanders Theater. This didn't happen in the 1980s when I was a law student. Yeah. And we can have a program that somebody like Sarah Lewis is organizing and all of this. We have access and opportunity. And the question that I'm just gonna keep insisting is that mm -hmm. we engage and we use it. Mm -hmm. When I wrote my book, mm -hmm. Just Mercy, I had the great fortune of working with Chris Jackson, one, an amazing black editor who, and I have this voice in my head as this uncle I grew up with, and he was always saying, they're not gonna let you do that. And you know, y'all know those kind of voices. Um, and I said, oh, I'm going to college. They're not gonna let you go to college. And I said, I'm going to Harvard. They ain't not gonna let you go to Harvard. And I could hear, I've been hearing him my whole life. I said, we're gonna open a museum on slavery. They're not gonna let you do that. And I was writing Just Mercy and I could hear him saying, they're not gonna let you say that in that book. But Chris was the kind of editor who said, not only will we, do we, are gonna let you do it, we want you to do it. And now we have these black artists and we have yeah. these black activists and we have historians yep. and teachers. And the challenge is, are we gonna use our narrative power yep. and focus it on things like mass incarceration and mm -hmm. focus it on things like algorithmic bias and focus it on mm -hmm. things like bigotry and exclusion? Because that's the tension. Right. Because there's another way to take your resources to take your Harvard degree, to teach in this space, and look the other way when yep. people are being excluded and pushed aside. Yep. And I've seen it, so I yep. can't, I'm not so, making that up. That, and, 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 and my point is, in the tradition of Douglas, in the tradition of Du Bois, in the tradition of Ida B. Wells, in the tradition of all of those matriarchs who shaped me when I got to Montgomery, Amelia Boynton Robinson, these kind of people, mm -hmm. Uh, Johnny Carr, when I moved to Montgomery, she told us we would get dressed up knowing they were going to beat us until we were almost dead. Mm -hmm. And I put on my best clothes and crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Mm -hmm. That was the kind of statement I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the presence of people like that, you appreciate the power of narrative. I just hope we use our skills and resources and our platforms mm -hmm. and focus it on the things that help the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the excluded, not just the celebrated, mm -hmm. not just the privileged, and we have celebration and privilege in the African-American community, too. I think that's the challenge that I'm talking yeah. about. No, I agree. Mm -hmm. So this campus, is having, this campus is having some important conversations right now. And so I cannot not pick the brains of two of the smartest people on the subject of mass incarceration, on the subject of prison divestment. Mm. <laughs> so. <laughs> We've got 20 minutes left, and I want you guys to help us think this through. Let's think it through. So I, I was actually just having a conversation about this right before uh, I came to the stage with President Backhow, and I think, you know, the issue is, and this, the narrative change is, is a means towards an end, and the end is how are we going to invest our resources? To me, the, the question is really about investments. What I wanted, you know, what my research shows and what we really have decided to do um, since the civil rights movement is respond to problems of inequality and unemployment and failing schools and violence with police and surveillance and incarceration. And that has not worked. 
that has not helped keep communities safer, inequality is widening, and so we need a different set of investments. In the era of deindustrialization, right, when domestic manufacturing leaves, the industry of the late 20th and 21st century is the prison industry, is law enforcement, is surveillance, and this has not worked. So to me, the, the question, and this seems to be, you know, the, in, in the back of our conversations over the past two days is really how can we change narratives in order to think about getting resources to people who have been systematically denied resources historically since slavery. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I think, um, why I'm so inspired by, by Brian's work because I think the first step in so much of this in terms of changing our worldview is really having a reckoning with our history and really reckoning with slavery. Um, With, with that, I mean, that's certainly my view, but I, and, uh, I mean, I think part of what I value in your work, and I, and I just want to say this, is that, that we make the connections, because what's interesting to me about what happens after uh, emancipation, and this is what Skip's documentary does so brilliantly, is that we actually use crime and criminality yes. to maintain mm -hmm. that status mm -hmm. as feared and rejected. Uh, you know, we just replaced the word slave with yep. criminal, yep. which is how we created convict leasing. Mm -hmm. And that most people don't know anything about convict leasing right. is part of the problem yep. because we didn't recognize, we haven't responded the way we're supposed to respond when we saw that rate of incarceration going up in the 1970s and 80s. And so that history, I do think, is really important. I think there's power in that. When you were talking earlier uh, uh, about how we don't know the names of people who were in these spaces. If you ask most Americans to name one African American that was lynched between 1877 and 1950, they can't give you a single name. Yeah. And that absence of consciousness is part of that problem. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the money question is critical mm -hmm. to the justice question. Mm -hmm. We went from $6 billion in spending on jails and prisons in 1980 to over $80 billion. That's a conservative estimate, mm -hmm. $80 billion. Mm -hmm. Last year in California, they were putting kids in juvenile facilities. They were spending almost $200,000 a year for each juvenile they put in a juvenile mm -hmm. detention facility. And if you imagine what mothers and grandmothers and cousins and fathers and brothers could do if somebody gave them a quarter of that, said, here's $50,000 to help your child deal with the challenges in your community. We're gonna give it to you every year for the next 10 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. It's, for me, mm -hmm. it's not hard to see why that wouldn't be a healthier investment right. in justice. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't have any space uh, for defending or justifying or rationalizing investing in prisons mm -hmm. or investing in policing or investing, I just don't. So, I will add to that, I think one of the most important things for us all to register too as we think about the policy environment of criminal justice is that I think, I think this is true and fair to say, you'll tell me if it's not, but I think it may be the case, I just qualified my own sort of <laughs> statement, that the most important thing that's happened for criminal justice reform in this country in the last 15 years is the Great Recession. Because those budget crises forced Texas and California to change direction. Mm -hmm. We don't want to use <laughs> a recession to get justice. Mm -hmm. But I think it does drive home the point that you have to take resources, you have to commit to taking resources out of criminal justice mm -hmm. and reinvesting those resources in other areas if you want to see a fundamental change. And I would put one other interesting narrative change on the table for people to think about. We forget that economics is full of narratives. So it's a, you know, it's a discipline, Sarah, next time. <laughs> Econ economics gotta be on the, on the stage too, okay? And we gotta talk about their narratives. And so there's this terrific economist at Stanford who has thought about university budgets. And she makes the argument that every single part of the university budget should be an investment in the thing you're doing, research and education. Now, that's interesting, because if you try to think about investment kind of underneath the penumbra of that idea, right, then you have to ask yourself, when are my investments over here undermining my investments over here? 
And if I'm investing lots of money in trying to recruit a really broad swath of students, and if my pool of African-American males is drying up because over here, I'm investing in the stuff that dries up that pool, it doesn't make sense. So that's, I'm just citing an economist there. <laughs> I want you to note. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm gonna push back though. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm changing okay, roles. Please. But, but how is this issue different from any other political issue that might be on the table that a university might be asked to stop investing in, and then, and then where does it end, and how can we make any sense? So, so yes, apartheid and tobacco, we understand that that's clear bright lines, but, but this is not a bright line. I disagree. Do you wanna... <laughs> <laughs> I do think that the university, that, that, univer that if we're gonna solve this problem of mass incarceration, it's gonna take all of us. Everybody in this room is complicit in this problem in some way. And it's not going to be undone by, and it's not going to happen by the, the, you know, the, the goodness of policymakers' heart. It's going to take all of us to rethink our priorities. I think that, you know, the institutions of higher ed education can address this issue in two ways. We educate people, so we can, we can, and, and a lot of my inspiration in this thinking has come from your work on education and inequality, Danielle. You know, we have a responsibility um, to educate and. People who are in prison, you know, the, the most, the, the, the greatest predictor of future incarceration is not race, but is tied to education. If you're a white man without a high school diploma, you are much more likely to go to prison than a black man with a high school diploma. So the people in prison are the most systematically undereducated people in our society. And I think that in this sense, incarceration presents us an opportunity to provide educational access to people who have not had that for, for a number of different structural reasons uh, throughout their lives. So as institutions of education, I think that we can ex help expand educational opportunities. And then of course, as institutions of research, we can bring scholars working with incarcerated populations and communities to address these problems. Um, I think you know more than what the university, the investments of the university, you know, we can make different kinds of investments and decide to step up to address um, some of these issues. And I think it's not just universities that need to do that. If we want to get, if we want to not be home to the largest prison system in the planet, it's going to take and history and history. It's going to take universities doing it. It's going to take it's going to take the banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, just uh, divested from private prisons. It's going to take institutions rethinking what their priorities are. And it's, you know, this is not a problem that any one sector or any single policy is going to completely solve on its own. I, I also think it's just really important to, to, to talk about the morality. I mean, you know, we talk about veritas here at this university. That's truth. And it's not true if it's aligned with things that are immoral and unjust and oppressive. And I think we should aspire to be moral. I mean, let's face it, slavery was profitable mm -hmm. to slave owners and those who exploited human beings in the way that they did. They always had an economic justification for abusing people. The six million people who fled the American South during the first half of the 20th century allowed the terrorists who terrorized them from the lands that they owned to profit from their fear and insecurity. Uh, there was something profitable about keeping black people from voting. You could actually pass laws that empowered uh, wealthy elites throughout that time. It's never sufficient to say, is the economic return for this investment going to be positive if we make the investment? Mm -hmm. There's another question you have to ask, and that is, is it right? Mm -hmm. And it's not right. It's just not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, I studied at the law school, I studied at the Kennedy School. I, I think I was taught that you're supposed to ask the question, is it right? We've got the highest rate of incarceration in the world. Six million people on probation and parole. 70 million people in this country with criminal arrest histories, which means that they can't get jobs sometimes and can't get loans. Women, rate of incarceration going through the roof. 70% of whom uh, are, are single parents with minor children at home. It's not right. And so I think the, the question is, 
After you ask, is it right? And I think the answer is obvious. Are we going to lead? Does truth mean leadership? Does veritas mean mm -hmm. leadership? I think mm -hmm. it does. Mm -hmm. And this institution has led mm -hmm. in yes. extraordinary ways. Mm -hmm. I want to pat it on the back. You know, there were civil rights acts that, that came out of this institution. W.E.B. Du Bois that you mentioned. We have led when the need for leadership mm -hmm. has arisen. And I just think this is one of those times when we need leadership. I will give you an example of leadership. Whenever I am in this space, I always like to point out that, that there pale male over there <laughs> wrote the first abolitionist pamphlet in the colonies in the 1760s, okay? So I was also thinking when we looked at Hank Lewis Thomas's presentation and he took All Lives Matter and turned it to All Lives Matter, you drop one more L, you get Allies Matter. Mm -hmm. Allies Matter. Yeah. And this place can lead and knows how to lead. Yes, when it wants to. So, yes, I agree. <laughs> now, okay, so you've helped us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I just have to say, I like that, Dan. You just slid that one right in there, but no, I'm feeling it. And I'm, I'm yeah, like, I like nodding it. along. <laughs> anyway. Okay, you've helped us with one, one issue. I would like to get you your help with another issue which picks up, connects us back to the, the previous panel because we are at a point where criminal justice and technology intersect. And the issue of algorithmic justice could not be more important in the criminal justice sector. And you, we saw a couple of slides there with sort of the risk assessment for um, people with arrest records and so forth. So Elizabeth and I are both in conversations, talking to people about reentry, how to facilitate increased reentry and so forth. Everybody wants to rely on algorithmic decision making to support this. We know exactly the way in which it reproduces underlying patterns of racial disparities and so forth. So here we are again, yet another place where the quantum discrimination, and in this case quite literal, quantum sort of algorithmically defined discrimination is baked into the process, is normalized, is accepted. How do we break that? I, I think we have to start by acknowledging there are no shortcuts. It's taken us, you know, 50, 60 years to kind of build this kind of infrastructure of over-incarceration that we're living in. And I think people keep looking for quick fixes. They quick look for these kind of drive-by solutions. And I just think we have to push back against that. There's a whole hierarchy of values and norms that have supported and sustained over-incarceration, uh, you know, policing, menacing of communities of color, and we have to take those apart. And I think we should be very, very skeptical when somebody says, oh, if we do this, the problem will be solved. And, and I think the prediction, uh, you know, predictions around human behavior are inherently problematic mm -hmm. in the criminal justice space. I mean, I, I do this with kids, so mm -hmm. I, you know, I represent a lot of children. And if you look at the lives of some of my clients and the abuse and the trauma and the suffering that they have lived through, uh, I, had, I, t I tell the story about a 14-year-old I represented who um, was living in a house where his mom was the target of a lot of domestic violence. This boy's mother ca came home one day, or the mother's boyfriend would start drinking, and then he'd get violent. The man came home one day, punched the boy's mother, she fell on the floor. Uh, she was unconscious and bleeding. He tried, to, the little boy tried to help his mom. He couldn't get her to revive. He thought his mom was dead. The man went into a bedroom. The little boy went into the bedroom. He was going to call the police, but he remembered he had a handgun, the man did, in a drawer, pulled out the gun, walked over to where the man was sleeping, pointed the gun at the man's head, and the man was snoring. When the man stopped snoring and jumped, the little boy jumped, and he ended up shooting the man in the head, killing him, tragic. <laughs> Tiny little boy, under five feet tall, under 100 pounds, 14 years of age. Uh, he was probably the kind of kid that might have been tried as a juvenile. No prior juvenile adjudications, no prior criminal histories, except for the fact that the man that he shot and killed, his mother's boyfriend, that man was a deputy sheriff. And because he was a deputy sheriff, the prosecutor insisted that this child be tried as an adult. Wow. So the judge certified him to stand trial as an adult, and they put him in an adult jail. Oh. And he'd been there three days. I went to the jail to see him. When he came out, he was just terrified. And I asked him questions. He wouldn't answer any of my questions. I put my pen down. I walked around the table. I got close to him. I said, come on, you got to talk to me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. He wouldn't say a word. And I couldn't figure out what to do. And so at some point, I just leaned on him. And if you leaned on, and when I leaned on him, he leaned back. Mm. And when he leaned back, I put my arm around him, and he began crying. And then he started 
talking to me about what had happened at the jail. And he told me on the first night, several men had hurt him. Then he told me on the next night, several people had raped him. Then he told me the night before I'd gotten there, so many people had hurt him, he couldn't remember how many there had been. And I held that little boy while he cried hysterically for almost an hour. I said, look, I'm going to get you out of here. You stay right here. And when I tried to leave, the little boy grabbed me by the arm and said, please, please don't go. Don't go. I said, no, it's okay. I'm going to get you out of here. And I left the jail, and of course the question I had in my mind, who's responsible for this? And the answer is, we are. Mm -hmm. But the point of this story is, if you tried to assess what the likelihood of recovery and success for that young man is, we don't have the data necessary to actually predict what happens. Mm -hmm. We got that little boy out of that place that day. Some amazing people, these beautiful mothers and grandmothers, kind of people I grew up with, wrapped their arms around this little boy. And we got him out, and uh, uh, he did this thing that he hadn't done before. He actually felt safe. And that little boy graduated from high school. Then he graduated from college. Then he got a master's degree in engineering. And now he has this beautiful family of, of two children, this wonderful wife. He calls me every month, and he says, Mr. Bryan, I just want you to know I'm doing okay. Oh. And for me, if you don't have that narrative in your head, you can't actually create the data set you need mm -hmm. to do the kind of predictive work that some of these folks are saying they can do. Mm -hmm. And that's why we should do what we can with what we have, but there's a whole lot about redemption. There's a whole lot about right. recovery. There's a whole lot about restoration. There's a whole mm -hmm. lot about love in the African-American community yeah. and other communities of color that defies any kind of restriction, mm -hmm. constraint, or definition. Mm -hmm. And it does. And, you know, so, and until we understand that, we should stop thinking that we can predict who's going to fail yes. and who's not going to mm -hmm. fail. Well, I, I, yeah. The question itself is the wrong question because you can take that data and say that what it's showing you is the degree of difficulty. And Joy, this is for you. Degree of difficulty, <laughs> all right? Because what that means is if you take it that way, then what it's helping you answer is the question of what help does this person need? Exactly. If your question is how can mm -hmm. I help this person, mm -hmm. you, can use, you can actually use the same data mm -hmm. and you'll get a completely different policy result. Mm -hmm. So. For me, that means it does go back to this conjunction of morality with narratives mm -hmm. that you guys, and that issue of beautiful questions. It's how can I help? Why did we lose that question? Yeah. Right. So final thoughts, Elizabeth. Well, just, I, you know, on that note, it makes me think of um, one of the organizations that I'm most inspired by right now. It's an organization called Advance Peace, and it was started by um, a man named Devon Bogan, and it's operating, it's beginning to expand, and it's operating right now in, um, in Richmond, California, in Stockton, California, where I've been doing a lot of research the past few years, and in Sacramento. Um, and this is, an, this is an approach to mentoring um, mostly young men, young men of color who are at risk of shooting somebody else, um, dying of gun violence, or, or, or going to prison. And when these young men make mistakes or in the program and the counselors who are involved are, are formerly incarcerated and many of them are former gang members, you know, the philosophy is we don't, they're not kicked out of the program. You know, if they're, if they're making mistakes, that means they need more love. And so, you know, I think what they're trying to do is change, is change narratives and give love to people um, who need love and using that as a response instead of, you're messing up, so let's lock you away in a cage. Um, so I think that, you know, we need to infuse these narratives with a love of one another and a, and a different kind of set of understandings and approaches to responding to what I see as the most pressing problems that we're facing right now as a society. And final thought. Uh, well, I, I'm just grateful that um, there are people, uh, there are historians like Elizabeth Hinton who are trying to tell the story in a new way that pushes us to see past those barriers. There are economists and political theorists like you, 
unmasking the way in a lot of ways these structures and systems have conspired to create these conditions. Uh, I'm energized by this event, by this conference. I wanna, I'm just so grateful to Sarah for bringing together these amazing people who use their talent and ability because ultimately um, that's what allows us to be inspired. And I don't think we're going to be able to overcome mass incarceration uh, without some inspiration. Mm -hmm. I mean, I tell people this all the time. You have to be willing to believe things you haven't seen uh, to create justice. There's no other way to do it. Uh, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I talk about my grandmother a lot. My grandmother was this amazing person who had this ability to inspire you to believe things you haven't seen. And I think that's what we have to do collectively. And when it comes to people coming out of jails and prisons, when it comes to people who have been incarcerated, it comes to their family members who have been burdened by that, I just wanna put a plug in for finding ways to embrace these communities and people. Uh, when I was a little boy, my grandmother did this thing where she started coming up to me and she'd give me these hugs and she'd squeeze me so tightly, I thought she was trying to hurt me. And then she'd, uh, then, so I learned, and then she'd ask me an hour later, she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? Mm -hmm. And if I said no, she would jump on me again. <laughs> and so by the time I was 10, my grandmother had trained me, she had taught me, uh, and every time I would see her, I'd say, Mama, I always feel you hugging me. <laughs> And she'd smile this smile, but I didn't understand what she was doing until I was much, much, much older. She worked as a domestic her whole life. Uh, and when she got into her 90s, she fell and she broke her hip. Uh, and then she was diagnosed with cancer. And I was in college and she was dying. And I went to go see her. She was on her deathbed and it was so hard for me. I was just pouring my heart out, just pouring my heart. I was holding her hand, her eyes were closed. I wasn't even sure she could hear me. And then it was time for me to leave. And I stood up to leave. And then my grandmother opened her eyes and she squeezed my mm. hand and then she looked at me and the last thing she said to me, she said, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? Mm -hmm. And then she said, I'm always going to be hugging you. Mm -hmm. And I say that to my clients and we collectively have to say it to people who have fallen down and who are vulnerable because mm -hmm. I think that affirmation, that witness is the way we restore dignity. Mm -hmm. It's the way we affirm humanity. And when our artists and our, t and our talented people and our gifted people and educated people, all of these folks find ways to get closer to this community that has been stigmatized mm -hmm. and demonized and we embrace them, we do something really important to create a new kind of architecture, a new kind of infrastructure for uh, a future that I think is going to really depend on, yes, our best knowledge, our best insight, our best technology, our best judgment, but also our best generosity, our best gift, our best love to help people recover from something so devastating as what we're living through right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, love <laughs> overrules. <Yes. laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.